Hello. All right. Today's just one topic, which is fantastic. Um, I have donned my, uh, I believe it's an owl hat to make this class a little bit more interesting or make me a bit more amusing while I record this. Um, <clears throat> we're going to be recovering the respiratory disease system and uh, disease and disorder. So here we go. Common signs and symptoms are a respiratory disease. Um, they could begin with pain anywhere in the respiratory tract. And there's an image there of the respiratory tract. Um, from the, uh, the, the nose to the lungs. Now your region, know your regions because these disorders we will be discussing today give medical terminology clues as to what is ailing the patient. Um, an example of localized pain would be, um, like an example would be like your sore throat. So we'd be looking at like the pharynx area. Um, often diseases in the respiratory tract come with a cough, either it's productive or non-productive, um, a chronic or acute. What I mean by productive is when a patient coughs, there's actually something to spit out. So it's considered dry or wet, uh, it's not dry, it's wet. Um, let's see here, there tends to be breathing irregularities like dyspnea, wheezing, tachnea. Um, other symptoms could be a fever, malaise, headache, or cyanosis, which, you know, means blue. All right, let's dive into our first disease, which is going to be allergic rhinitis. Like I said, we're going to start in the nose region, the nasal region. This is inflammation of the nasal membranes due to an allergic reaction to air particles. Um, just move the microphone a little closer. There we go. Um, air particles um, causing sneezing and rhinorrhea. It can be acute or chronic. It is a very common uh, disorder and affects about 40 to 50 million people in the United States. Etiology could be triggered by an IgE, which, it, it, which that's a, an immunoglobulin, um, that's part of your immune response, uh, to an allergen such as pollen, dust, animal dander, smoke, mold, really anything you're allergic to. Um, this is, a, let's see here, it's diagnosed with physical exam and a list regarding history of the symptoms. Blood tests or aller, uh, for allergy tests can locate the offender. Same for the pricking of uh, the pricking skin test. Other blood tests may reveal elevated levels of IgE, and a blood smear or count could show elevated eosinophils. This is a type of blood cell that um, has the job in the immune system to um, activate during allergic reactions. There are other things that trigger them as well, so it's not a catch-all, but environmental control measures and avoiding allergens is the main route of treatment. Um, if avoidance is not an option, there are medications and immunotherapy desensitization treatments out there that can help you too. Going a bit deeper in from the nose now, um, we're gonna hit the sinuses, so sinusitis inflammation of the sinuses. This is the inflammation of the paranasal sinuses. Acute is caused by the common cold. Chronic can be followed by bacterial or viral infections. Allergic sinusitis clearly is due to an allergen and then there is a hyperplastic which is a combination of purulent acute and allergic sinusitis. Causes are typically bacterial or fungal. Um, there's pneumococcal, streptococcal, haemophilus influenza. For fungus, these guys are becoming an increasing cause of chronic sinusitis, especially in individuals with weakened immune systems. Here's an image of what's going on behind the scenes. On the left is, the, is a healthy sinus cavity. On the right is an inflamed one. To diagnose sinusitis, a sample of nasal secretions may be taken for culture to identify the infectious agent. In some cases, x-rays and CT scans can be used to take a non-invasive, deeper look. Sinusitis is treated with analgesics for pain relief, decongestants, and antibiotics for the control of the bacterial infection. And if it's like anybody, I have to deal with this every winter. Now we travel further down um, the respiratory tract. We're going to go to the pharynx, which is pharyngitis. This is an inflamed throat. Again, acute or chronic cases do occur. Most common throat disorders um, where children often have about five incidents, of, sorry, five incidents a year and adults may um, maybe two per year. That is unless you are a parent of a toddler and then you just feel like you're sick all the time. Um, etiology, the bacteria Streptococcus pyogenes, or virally like influenza, or the common cold, rhinovirus. Pharyngitis can arise secondarily to other diseases or infections, like the measles or chickenpox. 
trauma to mucosal from heat, sharp objects, or chemical irritants too. Pharyngitis is chronic. It is usually due to persistent cough or allergies. Sore throat. <clears throat> That's our next one. The sore throat. Difficulty swallowing, malaise, fever, headache, coryza, or rhinorrhea are all signs and symptoms of pharyngitis. To diagnose, a physical exam reveals a red swollen mucous membrane um, where there could be pustular pharyngeal ulcerations visible to the naked eye. A thorough culture is collected to identify the infecting agent. And nowadays, there's a rapid, a, a rapid strep A test um, that can help screen this condition and expedite treatment or rule out strep throat so the physician can move on to other indications. Antibiotics could be prescribed if the cause was concluded to be bacterial. A warm saline gargle can help with inflammation, analgesics, antipyretics, uh, rest, and adequate fluid intake are all great forms of treatment. This image here is a rapid strep insert card uh, that you could come across in your labs. There's many variations of it. It kind of works like a pregnancy test. Um, one line is negative, two lines the patient's positive. Um, and basically the results are ready in minutes. Now to the larynx larynx we're going even further down the laryngitis is the inflammation of the laryngeal mucosa of the focal cords thus causing hoarseness this condition can be acute or chronic viral or bacterial it is diagnosed with a physical exam which includes info about how and when it began to determine the cause use the uh, image to familiarize yourself as to what can be affected and um, it is in the uh, what's located in the larynx region it will be helpful for the next couple of slides all right, starting with, uh, starting, starting with the epiglottis. When this is inflamed, it can be life-threatening as this is the tissue that covers the windpipes and has potential to block the airflow. It would swell on regards to an infection, possibly haemophilus influenza type B, more than likely. Um, an infection can also set in following any burns of hot liquids or direct injury to the strep throat, or I'm sorry, direct injury to the throat. Other causative agents could be bacteria and virus like pneumococcus, strep A, B, or C, candida albicans, or varicella zoster. A throat exam is needed to diagnose, but this time with the use of a flexible fiber optic camera since we have moved past where the eyes can alone see. Blood tests and throat cultures would be collected to establish the cause of any infection here. This link actually takes you uh, through one of the optic procedures known as fiber optic laryngoscopy. Take the time now, put me on pause, and view it. It's pretty interesting. Okay, I am. I am is an infectious mononucleosis. This is an acute infectious disease characterized by a sore throat, fever, swollen cervical lymph, lymph glands, and cervical is the uh, referring to the cervical spine, so in your neck area. Primarily, it affects adolescents and young adults. It is called it is caused by the Epstein-Barr virus. Um, we often refer to that as EBV. This virus is shed in saliva and spread through oral pharyngeal routes. So teenagers sharing drinks and swapping spit are high traffic routes for spread. Some have called this disease the kissing disease. EBV infects the B lymphocytes. Uh, the B lymphs are a type of white blood cell um, that is part of the immune system. This disease spreads very quickly, partially since a person can be contagious before symptoms set in um, until you're contagious until the fever subsides. All right, those symptoms, uh, those symptoms, I'm getting so tongue tied today, must be the hat. Those symptoms start off rather vague, malaise, anorexia, and chills. After about three to five days, a fever, sore throat, and lymph nodes in the neck swell. Sometimes, all right, pop quiz. The Epstein-Barr virus causes an infection in the what? Answer, B lymphocytes. Um, this was discussed in slide 13. There are two types of lymphocytes, T, like T, and B. B are the cells of concern here. Uh, medical terminology clue for the suffix sites, lymphocytes, means cells. Just to, something to help you remember. All right, getting a little lower now. We have journeyed deep enough that we have hit the lungs. Most of what we will discuss the rest of this lecture involve the lungs in some way, as it should since we are discussing the respiratory tract. Uh, pneumonia, this is an acute inflammation. 
of the respiratory bronchioles. This is the tree branches of the lungs. Alveolar, alveolar ducts, sacs, and alveoli, where gases is exchanged from O2 for CO2, so oxygen for carbon dioxide in the blood. Pneumonia can be unilateral or bilateral, meaning one or both lungs, and it does not have to take over the entire lung. Sometimes it only affects a portion of it. Lober pneumonia affects more than one lobe. The right lung has three lobes, three, and the left has two. If you can or you can see them pointed out in the diagram to the right if it helps you remember um, your heart is located on your left there isn't room for three lobes only two so three is for the right i'm sorry three is for the right two is for the left bronchopneumonia is the bacterial form of pneumonia and then there is the interstitial pneumonia that causes scarring of both lungs etiology caused by bacterial or viral with bacterial forms being more serious Fungus, parasites, protozoa, rickettsiae live inside the cells. Pneumonia can arise secondary to systemic diseases also as the blood flows through the lung tissues or it can be induced by chemicals or dust. Coughing, sputum production, pleuritic chest pain, shaking chills, fever, rails, rails which is a chest rattling sound, dyspnea, cyanosis, and an overall weakness attribute to signs and symptoms of pneumonia. To diagnose, history and physical exam, chest x-ray, and sputum can be collected for culture and gram stain smears. As well as having blood cultures drawn because if bacteria are in the blood, it's more than likely going to be in the lungs. Treatment varies depending on the severity of the disease. Antibiotics are given, um, humidified O2 therapy. The mechanical ventilation may be needed if the lungs are too weak to fight an infection and function on their own. Another disease that afflicts the lungs is Legionnaire's disease, often referred to as Legionella pneumonia. A Legionella infection is an acute bronchopneumonia di disease. There are two forms, Legionnaire's disease and Pontiac fever. Both are caused by the gram-negative bacillus bacterium of Legionella pneumophilia. Use this link to see how this bacterium and the disease spread. It's a bit scary, but understandable to see how it is related to small outbreaks like at the Playboy Mansion in the grotto and also from wiper fluid located in the United Kingdom. Don't believe me? Google it. Legionnaire's disease is, designed, is, is diagnosed by hearing fine crackles at time of oscillation and with a chest x-ray that would reveal pneumonia. The most common lab test is a urine antigen test, which detects Legionella bacteria from the urine. Sputum is collected and a direct fluorescent antibody test is performed. Other lab studies show elevated leukocytes, ESR, which is at um, sedimentation rate, liver enzymes activities, bronchial washing, blood and pleural fluid, uh, those are cultured, and then a setup to rule out other potential pulmonary infections. All right, COPD. This is functional diagnosis given uh, to any pathological process that decreases the ability of the lungs and bronchi to function and perform proper ventilation. It is best described in a commercial, honestly, that I'm sure that you all have seen, but use this link to see the animated description. So put me on pause and watch it. Chronic pulmonary emphysema is a permanent enlargement of air spaces beyond terminal bronchioles resulting from destruction of the alveolar wall. Basically, the lungs lose their elasticity. Chronic bronchitis is an inflammatory disorder of the bronchi, uh, bronchial mucose membranes with hypertrophy and hyperplasia. This condition yields a productive wet cough. Etiology of COPD. This arises due to diseases that lead up to COPD like chronic asthma, bronchiostasis, silicosis, pulmonary tuberculosis, predisposing fa oh man predisposing factors i apologize everyone uh, predisposing factors make some patients more at risk factors like smoking exposure to polluted air respiratory infections allergens and or breathing textile dust fibers signs and symptoms can be insidious slow and progressive until lung damage has set in there can be a chronic cough chest tightness increased mucus production, dyspnea, and this term is coined um, also the barrel chest, seen with pulmonary embolism, or I'm sorry, not pulmonary embolism, pulmonary emphysema. The image here gives a visual to the barrel chest, uh, which 
would it kind of shows you what the uh, patient would look like. It's it's a barrel formation because the lungs are working a lot harder. COPD is diagnosed with similar respiratory tests listed before. History, physical exam, chest x-ray, pulmonary function tests, arterial blood glass, bud, arterial blood gases drawn from an artery sputum analysis and CT scan. The main goal to a treatment plan is to prevent any complications of further damage to the lungs. Relief of symptoms, bronchodilators, inhaled corticosteroid medicines, oxygen therapy, diuretics, and um, even surgery to remove parts of the um, lungs that are damaged are all forms of COPD treatments. Pop quiz. Chronic disorder causing permanent enlargement of the air spaces beyond the bronchioles due to destruction of the alveolar walls is called what? Uh, think barrel. Uh, slide 21. The answer is emphysema. Now, on to asthma. This is a recurrent attack with labored breathing and wheezing. Two forms, intrinsic and extrinsic. Intrinsic is when attack is without evidence of allergy um, and begins in adulthood. Extrinsic are bronchospasms due to an allergy, to an allergic response to some form of environmental irritant, most common in childhood. Causes not pinpointed on one specific thing. There can be a family history of allergies and it can make a person more prone. Common triggers include an upper respiratory infection, allergens, irritants, smoking, exercise or extra exertion, changes in temp or humidity, and strong emotions can trigger an asthma attack. All right, I'm sorry, I'm getting so warm in this hat and sweater. I'm recording winter lectures in the middle of the summer right now. Okay, now on to asthma. This is a recurrent attack with labored breathing and wheezing, two forms, intrinsic and extrinsic. Intrinsic is when an attack is without evidence of allergy and begins in adulthood. Extrinsic are bronchospasms due to an allergic response to some form of environmental irritant, most common in childhood. Causes not pinpointed on one specific thing, and there's family history of allergies can make a person more prone. Common triggers include an upper respiratory infection, allergens, irritants, smoking, exercise or exertion, changes in temp or humidity, and strong emotions can all trigger an asthma attack. So how do you know if someone's having an asthma attack? Well, there tends to be pronounced wheezing, dyspnea, tachnea, chest tightness, profuse perspiration, exhibited pallor, and that's paleness, um, and difficulty speaking. If a person can't take a breath in, it's gonna be hard to, to speak. Asthma is diagnosed with a history and physical, chest x-ray, sputum analysis, pulmonary function test, arterial blood gases, mm -hmm. ECG, sorry, that was my phone, um, a blood skin allergen detection test to find the trigger. The image here is a um, diagram of arterial blood gas, like where it would be drawn. Notice that the blood is drawn from the artery, not the vein, and where most phlebotomy occurs. There are many ways of treating asthma. First and foremost would be to avoid any of the triggers. Uh, find ways to achieve adequate oxygenation and bronchodilation. This can be done with medication inhal medicated inhalers. Oh, man, I'm so sorry my phone keeps going out. Here. There we go. Usually I don't have it in here. <laughs> um, let's see here. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, so you find ways to get adequate oxygenation and bronchodilation. This can be done with medication, medicated inhalers. Some are decreasing airway inflammation. These inhalers provide preventative and quick relief options. All right, pop quiz. Asthma is recurring attacks of labored breathing um, accompanies by what other symptom? What's one symptom that really sets an asthma attack apart from every other? Wheezing. Okay, let's move on to another one. Lung abscess. This is an area of necrotized lung tissue containing purulent matter, so dead lung tissue that is creating pus, basically. Abscesses are more frequent in the lower right dependent portion of the lungs. The major determinant is developing, or in developing a lung abscess is the ability of the causative microorganism to necrotize the lung tissue. A lung abscess also may be produced by a septic embolism or a clot being carried to the lung in the pulmonary circulation. To diagnose, there'll be chest oscillations, reveal crackles and decreased breathing sounds. A chest x-ray is performed. Uh, Precutaneous aspirations may be used to obtain cultures to identify a bacterial cause. Bloody 
purulent sputum cultures and blood cultures may be used in the same identifying manner. TB, more specifically pulmonary tuberculosis. This is a rather slow developing bacterial lung infection with progressive necrosis of lung tissue. It starts with phagocytosis. This is the ingestion of bacteria by a cell as an immune system response. From here, the infection then grows into inflamed granular or I'm sorry, granular appearing tissue. This is often referred to as a granuloma. These granulomas can calcify and be seen on an x-ray. The bacteria of concern that triggers TB is mycobacterium tuberculosis. This bacterium can lay dormant for years and then become reactivated when conditions are perfect. Transmission occurs via aerosol droplets and are exhaled by an infected person and then inhaled or become in contact with a new host. These bacteria most commonly affect the lungs, but can also infect other regions of the body. This link here will take you to a site that has two nice animated videos talking about tuberculosis, so take the time now to watch them. To diagnose, along with a physical exam, a chest x-ray or CT scan and bronchoscopy are performed. The tuberculin test is rather common as well. This is also known as the Manitox test. This consists of an intradermal injection just below the skin surface, usually the forearm. The injection contains purified proteins derivative of the tuberculin bacillus. The TB skin test cannot determine if the disease is active or dormant. To do that, a sputum analysis is needed. A TB blood test, also called the interferon gamma, gamma release assay, measures how strong a person's immune system reacts to TB bacteria. The bacteria may also be identified in the patient's urine, body fluids, or tissue via cultures. Pneumoconiosis is a respiratory tract disease caused by inhalation of inorganic or organic dust particles and chemicals over prolonged periods of time. It is often an occupational disorder associated with mining and stone cutting. Four most frequent varieties of pneumoconiosis are silicosis, asbestosis, berylosis, and anthrocosis. Review pages 324 to 326 in the text for more in-depth details. The black lung reference I have here um, in our meme is referring to the disorder given to those who work in coal mines after breathing in coal dust for years. It's also from a funny movie called Zoolander. I recommend if you need a good laugh, um, not uh, working in a coal mine. Respiratory mycosis, myco meaning fungal. Not as easy to remember, but like many medical terms, it has Greek roots. Mykes is the Greek word for fungus, hence myco. This disease is a systemic fungal infection that extensively affects the lungs and includes histoplasmosis, coccygeomycosis, and blastomycosis. Histoplasmosis, or Darling's disease, is caused by Histoplasma capsulatum. This fun fungus is found in soil, especially those contaminated with bird or chicken poo. This is a big one in our state due to riverbanks and forested caves uh, infested with droppings. Coccygeomycosis, the San Joaquin Valley feet. Uh, valley fever is caused by the fungus Coxioides imitis. This fungus is common in dry desert soils of California, New Mexico, Nevada, and Arizona. The last one listed is blastomycosis, Mo more specifically North American blastomycosis. It is caused by blastomycosis dermatitis. It can be, uh, it can cause cutaneous infections, but it will usually affect the lungs in some variation. To diagnose histoplasmosis, there would be a chest x-ray ordered, a positive histoplasma skin test, sputum culture, or specially stained biopsy tissue confirms diagnosis. Like bacteria that stain a certain um, color or certain patterns, fungus does also. This first image is histo. Coccygeomycosis is diagnosed with a positive coccygeomycosis skin test and special serological tests for confirmation. To diagnose blastomycosis, a culture is done to isolate the fungus from sputum or skin lesions, since they can affect both regions. Tissue biopsy from the skin or lungs might have to be done as well. Okay, a new disease, uh, but still the lungs. This is pneumothorax, AKA the collapsed lung. This is when a collection of air or fluid in the pleural cavity uh, results in, this is gonna be a tough word for me, adelcatasis, adelcatasis, which is a complete or partial collapse of one or both lungs. Excuse me. They are imaged here. This condition can be spontaneous or traumatic. Now here comes one of my favorite medical terms that does not sound like any medical term that you've ever heard of. It's called a bleb. That's right, B-L-E-B, bleb. A bleb is a collection of air 
along the lung surface. If that bleb were to rupture, it would cause pneumothorax. Review pages 327 and 328 for more in-depth information, maybe on bleb. All right, pleurisy or pleuritis. This is the inflammation of the visceral and parietal pleural membranes that surround the lungs. It can be primary or result secondary to other conditions. This disease is associated with pleural effusion or water on the lungs. What causes this? It is caused by infection of the pleural of the microorganisms like bacteria, fungi, parasites, or viruses. Inhaling toxins or chemicals can have a primary effect on the lungs. Secondary effects could be a result of pneumonia, heart failure, um, pulmonary infection, neoplasm, SLE, pulmonary embolism, and chest trauma. Signs and symptoms of pleuritis. There is a sharp stabbing pain that can limit movement. Other symptoms include coughing, fever, chills, dyspnea, and chest pain that increases during inspiration. It is diagnosed with a chest oscillation that reveals pleural flexion rub. A chest x-ray, CT or ultrasound, and blood tests could show signs of an infection. A part of pleuritis uh, was pleural effusion, the water in the lungs, which should clearly not be there unless you're a fish. Pleural effusion is not just water in the lungs, it's excess fluid between the parietal and visceral pleural membranes enveloping each lung. The accumulating fluid is transducive which means it has little or no protein. On the opposite spectrum, when it's exudate, it would be chock full of protein. These terms come in handy when looking at the disease etiology. Transitive or transidate pleural effusions frequently result from CHF, hepatic diseases with ascites and peritoneal dialysis. Exudate pleural effusions are more commonly seen um, with inf uh, inflammation of the pleural, TB, RA, which would be rheumatoid arthritis, pancreatitis, respiratory neoplasm, and bacterial pneumonia. Oscillations of the chest reveals decreased breathing sounds with percussions or tapping of the body surface. A dull sound is heard over the effused area. A chest x-ray and lab analysis of extracted fluid is used to determine if the effusion is transitive or exitive. Because again, we're looking at proteins. Pulmonary embolism, sometimes just referred shorthand as PE. This is a mass of undissolved matter in pulmonary artery or branches. This arises from complications of venous thrombosis, which is another name for clot. This is a very serious condition and can be life-threatening. Generally, the clot originates in pelvic veins or deep lower extremity veins. Remember the long flight reference I made on the previous lecture. It then travels through the circulatory system until it blocks the pulmonary artery. Patients with body casts, CHF, varicose veins, polycythema vera, thrombocytosis, neoplasms, post-op, and women taking oral contraceptives, which are birth controls, are at higher risk for a pulmonary embolism. What are the signs? It depends on the size and location of the embolus to really determine the symptoms, so it could vary. There would be dyspnea, which would be difficulty breathing, tachnea or rapid breathing, pulmonary hypertension, substernal pain, that's the below your sternum, which is the bone between your ribs, pleuritic pain, tachycardia, low-grade fever, and apprehension or confusion. PE is diagnosed with a history of predisposing conditions like high-risk list in slide. Uh, slide 40. EK, or ECG, chest x-ray, blood test, pulmonary angiogram, MRI and CT, and oscillation. It is treated by maintaining adequate cardiovascular and pulmonary function while aiming to clear any obstructions. Now this next form of treatment term boils most of lab tech's blood and that's blood thinners. The blood is not really thinned, its coagulation triggers are deactivated, and it is coagulation that causes clots. So in a closed system, preventing clots is good, but if that system becomes open, like say from an accident or cut, clotting is kind of important. So calling them like they really are is an anticoagulant, not necessarily a blood thinner. Also fibrinolytic therapy and surgery could also treat a pulmonary embolism. Okay, you've heard me mention this uh, one before. It's respiratory acidosis. This is where excessive acidity of body fluids attributed to the inadequate removal of carbon dioxide, CO2. This removal process happens in our lungs, more specifically in the alveolar sacs, which is this image here in the right. See the image, find how blue turns to red. Whenever CO2, which would be the blue, cannot be adequately ventilated, the CO2 in the blood rapidly increases. This is bad. 
when O2, not CO2, in our lungs and blood. As the level of CO2 and PA, or PaCO2, that's partial pressure carbon, uh, carbon dioxide arises, the amount of carbon dioxide that combines with water in your blood and forms carbonic acid. So the blood pH decreases, making it acidic. Refer here to the image in the bottom right uh, of a pH chart to get an idea of what that means. Blood is in the middle, it's nice and neutral. As it becomes more acidic, the number's lower, indicating an acidic reaction. This condition can be chronic or acute. If acute, it occurs when sudden impairment of ventilation results from an airway obstruction. These obstructions can occur due to certain drugs, neuromuscular diseases, cardiac arrest. If chronic, it can be caused by pulmonary disease such as emphysema, bronchitis, and COPD. It may also be caused by extreme obesity and obstructive sleep apnea, which we'll talk about later. Clearly, if the blood is becoming acidic, this can be diagnosed with a blood test. Arterial blood gases testing is drawn to confirm elevated PaCO2 in suspecting patients. The use of a chest x-ray, CT, and MRI, and pulmonary function test supplements the diagnosis, but if no obvious signs of respiratory acidosis are present, a drug screen can be performed. All right, there's that pH scale again, but this time we're looking at the other end, respiratory alkalosis. This is excessive alkalinity of a blood a fluid attributed to the excessive removal of CO2. When excessive amounts of CO2 is ventilated by the lungs, the PaCO2 in the blood decreases. This initiates a series of chemical and metabolic changes that act to reduce the level of serum bicarbonate. Thus, the pH of the blood increases. Respiratory alkalosis can be chronic or acute as well. If acute, it may be the result of hyperventilation induced by anxiety or physiological trauma. This is often portrayed on TV by someone breathing into a paper bag accompanied by a laugh reel. Acute is also brought on by fever, pain, salicylate poisoning, excessive exercise, or excessive use of mechanical ventilators. Chronic causes would also arise from a type of hyperventilation, but more slowly and associated with chronic cardiopulmonary disease or high altitudes if the patient's not used to them. Diagnostic procedures confirm decreased levels of serum bicarb and decreased PaCO2 via an ABG, arterial blood gas. CBC analysis, a complete blood count analysis, chest x-ray, and CT scan can also be supplemental to the diagnosis. All right, new one, sleep apnea. This is when an individual's breathing at night repeatedly stops and starts in an unnaturally rhythmic process. Often it is accompanied by loud snoring. There are three types of sleep apnea. Obstructive, and this is when the throat muscles relax. Then there's central sleep is when the brain, goes, uh, brain does not send proper signals to muscles that control breathing. And then complex apnea is a combination of both, obstructive and central. This image here is a common mask um, that people wear at night that keeps their airways open via sensing respiration rates and pressures. It also keeps snoring at bay, which is nice. The etiology of sleep apnea is when throat muscles relax, airways become narrowed, and with involvement of the epiglottis at times, breathing temporarily stops. The brain causes the patient to wake up slightly and to take a breath. Repeated incidences cause oxygen level in the blood to fall, and often the patient becomes sleep deprived. This could lead to difficulty functioning throughout the day. People who suffer from sleep apnea often think they have a good night's sleep and can fall asleep rather fast at any point of the day. But it is not due to them being good sleepers, it's because their body is actually craving sleep and needs it, but is denied it. The image here is how a sleep process should go each night where a person slips in and out of REM and NREM. If a patient has to continually be woken up by the brain to take a breath, neither sleep cycles are reached and the body is truly not at rest. How is something like this di diagnosed though? By science, of course, it starts with a patient's history and physical exam being taken, then a sleep study is ordered or nocturnal polysomnography. This measure, some, or this uh, is a test that measures someone's brain waves while sleeping, along with respirations and oximeters. Uh, the oximeter is checking oxygen in the blood, and that's that white clip that goes on people's fingers sometimes when they're in the hospital. If a patient can't come to a clinic, then there are portable cardiorespiratory monitoring systems out there that can complement the diagnosis as well, but it's really ideal to do a true sleep study. All right, next disease we're going to discuss is lung cancer. This is when various malignant neoplasms have been discovered in the lung tissue. They can appear in the trachea, bronchia, or air sacs in the lungs. It's a leading cause of cancer deaths in both sexes. 
there are two major types non small cell which is more common and slow growing and spreading and then there's small cell carcinoma 86 or i'm sorry 87 percent of lung cancer is caused directly or indirectly from smoking so don't smoke the other 13 percent is made up of a random gas or a random exposure which a radon exposure which is the second cause but also a long-term exposure to asbestos which would be mesothelioma uranium arsenic and some petroleum products contribute to that 13 percent chest x-ray sputum cytology fiber optic bronchosco bronchoscopy tissue biopsy helical low dose ct scan can detect small tumors blood tests may bring light to me um, metastasis and ct and mri are all used in diagnosis of lung cancer and what type of lung cancer it is lung cancer is treated with a type of combination of surgery radiation chemotherapy photodynamic therapy in the if the tumors are small enough all right SIDS this is sudden infant death syndrome this is an unexpected and unexplained death of an otherwise healthy infant it usually occurs at the point when an infant is about 10, uh, 10 to 12 weeks old death most often comes in a baby uh, to a baby while they're sleeping more often occurs in male infants than females and in, especially in premature babies this is an unexplained bewildering disorder and etiology is unknown possibilities loom that could include mechanical accidental suffocation by something may be found in the infant's crib, prolonged apnea, lack of vitamin B complex, uh, potentially maybe an unknown virus, immunological abnormalities, defects in respiratory mucosa, or an abnormal formed uh, larynx. Let's venture back up the respiratory tract and talk about acute tonsillitis. I would have discussed this when we were in that region, but I did not want to end this week's talk about something as sad as SIDS. So tonsils it is. Acute tonsillitis is an inflammation of the tonsils. It usually affects the palatine tonsils and can be acute or chronic. The most frequent cause of uh, tonsillitis is bacterial and it's staph and strep again. Streptococcus pyogenes or Staphylococcus aureus. This, order, or this disorder is a rather common secondary complication to pharyngitis. Signs and symptoms. We have seen discussed before. Sudden onset of chills, high-grade fever, mild to severe th sore throat, malaise, headache, dysphagia, and tonsillar hypertrophy or abscess. A physical exam is needed for diagnosis, as, a collection of, as is a collection of a throat swab for culture in order to determine which bacterial it is. Blood tests may be uh, taken also to reveal elevated leukocytes. Tonsillitis is treated with antibiotics, saline gargles for comfort, analgesics, antipyretics, and tonsillectomy, which is where you have your tonsils removed. Also seen in the mouth is thrush. This is a yeast infection of the mucous membrane um, lining the mouth and tongue. Thrush is a normal bacteria that's in our body, but it, during thrush, the bacteria has taken over. It is commonly seen in infants and diabetics or in patients on long-term antibiotic use. It is also seen regularly in patients uh, with compromised immune systems, someone who might be on chemotherapy or is suffering from HIV and AIDS. Our last disorder is croup. This is an acute severe inflammation and obstruction of the upper respiratory tract causing a bark like cough um, and a persistent strider strider is a, a, a harsh high pitch sounding um, uh, sound during respiration seen often in infants and young toddlers up to the age of three it is treated symptomatically and diagnosed by cultures and an, uh, uh, an x-ray or possible of a laryngoscopy and to be sure the child did not swallow something that is caused by discomfort of the airway because children love to put stuff in their mouth this is not life-threatening usually but the child is, is the child is still typically um, in distress or uncomfortable all right that's it for our respiratory disease and disorders congrats on making it this far and sticking it out it's all downhill from here now the midterms are done uh, they are behind us and finals are straight ahead we will continue with our weekly discussions on talon per usual tips for quiz eight are listed here as always use your objectives as a study guide please reach out with any questions or concerns and good luck i will see you all see you all next week